It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn, teaching you to be the hotel you're that you wanna be. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn. Anthony, I'm so psyched because we are still here at the Cobblestone Hotels Conference in Denver, one of my favorites. Yeah, we slept on the stage. What was that? We slept on the stage last night. Oh, we did. <laughs> we have another show, right? I know. I know. This is so exciting. I really love being able to do these live shows from annual conferences. So much fun. So now I understand that we have questions from the audience that are pre, right. that, that basically you have in the little system here. Right. And I have not... Read them or know everything's coming out. So we're both going into this uh, uh, right. naked, I guess. I can, we get the, uh, can we get the app on the uh, screen and the first question up on the screen? All right, I guess I'll have to go over here. All right, what future guest experience enhancement technologies do you foresee dominating the hospitality industry? The future of hotel technology, what is going to dominate? Anthony, how do you see it? I really think that this, you know, um, checking in online, you know, one of the things, the kiosks, you know, there's been some success in that. The key, where you get the key and you, and you check in uh, and you're able to use your, your phone as a key. Hilton um, has been successful somewhat in that arena. But I really think in a couple of years, when you're coming from the airport and you're in the car, you're going to check yourself in, you're going to get your room, you're going to have your, your phone as your key, and you're going to bypass the front desk. And I think we're kind of kind of almost there, but we're not quite there. And I think that that's going to be a no-brainer. In five years, it's going to be like self-driving cars. I love it. How do you see it, Brian? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. So I'm... I'm, I'm I, I shouldn't bring up other hotel names, but I, I'm, I'm really, when I travel, if there's not a cobblestone, the Hilton app's pretty cool. You know, you can check in, you can, you don't have to go, you can bypass the front desk. So you go right to your room. So that's, that's, uh, we are, we are looking into a few of those options right now. Yeah. And I think in a couple of years, it's just going to be a no brainer. Um, I was just out in Vegas and, uh, there was a really long line at one of the hotels and another hotel had, um, the iPads. And they seem to be working better. And I, but I think for me personally, when I'm in the car ride from the airport, if I can check into the hotel room, I'm going to do that 100 times out of 100 times. Right. Well, I see it a little bit differently. I think the big future technology you're wrong, Glenn. is going to be. What's wrong. that? Whatever you're going to disagree with, you're wrong. It, totally. That's why I love working with you to really uh, <laughs> deflate my ego constantly. So um, I think it's going to be all about artificial intelligence and using artificial intelligence in meaningful ways to both enhance the customer experience while finding uh, operational efficiencies in it. But it's finding that right balance that I think is going to be the big trick. It is an example. What would you think would be the first thing that really? What? Give me an example of what um, you think I'm a intelligence. big believer in. Um, uh, we're moving into the era of heightened personalization. We are all a culture where we want things done our way, the way we want to do it. I mean, you go to Starbucks, you're not forced into having anything specific. You get to make your choices. It's the same thing with the hospitality experience. For years, we've been telling hotel companies what we want from them, but haven't been getting it back in a way that's emotionally satisfying. I think we're on the precipice of big change where that's actually going to happen, and hotels are going to be able to create individualized experiences for lots of people at a single time. Can you say precipice again? Precipice, precipice, right. precipice. So That's actually my mantra. I use that before going to sleep every day. What's the right. second question? Next question. Um, besides financial incentives, what could be good motivators to change an already great staff into a super staff? Well, Anthony, this is right up your alley, my friend. Um, I was looking at the last question because I have a good answer for that. Um, really, and, and I think a lot of companies spend so much time and energy in thinking about that, and I simply think it's about what we talk about in our last episode, where it's about if you inspire people, you're transparent, you're vulnerable to them, and you give them kind of what the forecast is for the company and the opportunities. What people want is people want opportunities and control. One of the things you're seeing, because of technology, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. So building your personal brand doesn't mean go out and start your own company. It means having more freedom. It has having more flexibility for your family. And I think the more a company does that, the more success you have. Of course, bonuses, incentives, and salary all ties into that. But people want to feel inspired, and people want to feel like they're working for a company that's not going to get screwed, they're not going to get stabbed in the back, and that there's opportunities down the road. Right, and in our, our last episode, we talked about how cobblestone, people seem to feel like it's a sense of family, and I think that plays in exactly to what you're saying. You need to have that sense of safety and security in order to, to maximize your, your career. 
Brian, you want to add to that? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I'm trying to watch this and, and, and not completely right. paying attention. So uh, um, That's fine. I don't I know it's, I know it's, I know it's on, the, on the staffing, but um, obviously the staffing. So is, why don't we just, why don't we just okay. move on to uh, the next uh, can uh, we ask question? The, can we ask the... Uh, I'm going to ask that question. Which question? What is the weirdest marketing tactic that you've seen that actually worked, and maybe one that didn't? Uh, get a TV show. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, when people say, why do you get a TV show? Right. I said, because when I created it, I wanted to have my own management company and my own brand. So I said, I don't have billions of dollars to invest. Uh, so I'll develop a TV show, see if that works out. So, so far, that was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what kind of, uh, what would you suggest for the mere mortals out there in the audience looking to, uh, to promote themselves? Listen, everyone, we, we all talk about, we, a lot of people have children in, in this room. And uh, I truly believe, and I, and I can't, uh, stress it enough, just just trust your instincts. You know, even the way we've come together, I just trusted you're the guy I should do my first podcast with, and it's worked out beautifully. I mean, 10 times better than I anticipated. So just really trusting your instinct is, is to me, the, the, the best right. part. But as far as marketing well, I do, well, goes, I do like that you had very little faith in, in me at the which, beginning, and it worked out well. So. No, I had a lot of faith in you. I had a lot of faith <laughs> in you. I really did. From the beginning, I wouldn't, we wouldn't have partnered up. But I think from a, from a marketing standpoint, is one of the things I look at, there's two, right, there's PR and then there's marketing. I look at a hotel, and I've been in plenty of older hotels where people are trying to make it something it isn't. Be who you are. So if you're, you're a hotel, I go over the walls and I go, okay, what does this hotel want to be? And it speaks to me. And whatever that hotel wants to be and whatever that community feels like, that's what it needs to be. When you go out and you do something that's completely out of your core and completely out of what you're about just to get attention, right. it doesn't make sense. And I remember when we were at the uh, Forbes Verified Five Star event at the uh, Beverly Hilton back in February, um, you were moderating a, a panel with uh, Chip Conley, formerly of uh, Joie de Vie Hotels, which he created. And he said, um, when it comes to hotels, they, they used to create hotels based on three like key words that would inform them of the personality of the hotel and everything that they should do from that point forward in terms of marketing the property. Right. It's like, it's, it's like if you have a child and you're trying to force your child to be a doctor and your child wants to do, you know, be in theater or vice versa. You, you, have, to take your, you have to take it at face value. Right. And then bring your skills and your uh, creativity to it. It's never where you're trying to make something, you know, out of nothing. You, it ha you have to start with something. And I, I think that's the greatest advice. Yep. Now, Brian, uh, what about you in terms of marketing? Maybe you could tell us what you're thinking about in terms of the marketing. One of the other questions we had there are, will we see some cobblestone TV ads? Which I'm not necessarily sure makes sense for your company because of the way it's structured, but how do you see marketing here? Sure, and apologize, we fixed our technical difficulties. So, um, yep. at the cobblestone TV ad, easy answer, no. Yeah. Um, but 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 let's be honest. Who stays at a hotel because they saw a commercial on it? You're, you're traveling. Most of the time, you're going to research. You're going to Google. Not like as Josie talked earlier, um, how you traveled. 20, 30 years ago was a billboard. You didn't know what you were going to get. You're, you're looking online. You're looking at reviews. You're not, I mean, we could go do a TV ad, but I just don't think that it would, it would give, give the impact that you're looking for. And well, also, also, most hotel TV ads are just so blah, they don't make any con connection right. to you at all. They could be any brand whatsoever. Right. Yep. Um, so when it when it comes to what you're thinking, I think it makes sense a lot more for you folks to just be able to connect with people on the internet. Is he stalking me again? Yeah. <laughs> you guys have done this before, huh? <laughs> All right. Yeah, you want to answer? The, the, the other thing with you know backing up a little bit on the TV ad. Now I'm just going to go into a little sales pitch on, on on cobblestone. But we don't take a lot of marketing fees where the other brands are taking three, four, five percent of your revenue, our philosophy has been that money stays into the local operations. Yep. You spend that as you see fit locally because that's a, that's a bigger impact. But the little bit amount of money that we're taking, we're using on online marketing, directories, that kind of thing. Excellent. All right, so uh, next question. Um, Anthony, you seem to have the hire slow and fire fast principle down. What things do you look for when you decide it's time to fire someone or do it a turnaround? You know, whoever asked that question, I, I've never been asked that question before, but that's probably my favorite question of all times. That's why I asked it. Um, oh, is that you? <laughs> no, no, oh, it wasn't me, oh. but I saw but, it, and I'm like, this but, is his sweet spot. I, I was like, you know, when you go into a hotel, there was one hotel in Orlando I, I went into, it's 1,500 rooms, it had 2,000 employees, and um, I had 17, 18 executives, uh, high-paying executives, very high-paying. 
And within six weeks, I had seven, I, I basically, or they either quit or I let them go. 17 executives left. Wow. The only person I kept on was the CFO because I'm not an idiot. I can't be a CFO as I'm running a hotel. And um, the ownership called me. Actually, the ownership is only 15 minutes from where I'm standing right now. And they called me and they said, you've lost your mind. I said, well, you hired me. Didn't you know that? And I was like, listen, this is a big operation. There's a lot at risk here. They're about to pull the brand. You're, you know, there's a lot going on. I have no time for mediocrity. I need to have superstars around me constantly. And so we went through about three months of hiring very slowly, getting a super team around me, and me kind of putting myself out of a job and just listening to really smart people. So I'd rather suffer for a short period of time than suffer for a long period of time. So yes, I do hire slow. I do want to get that superstar, and they're out there. And then when that person, because sometimes my instincts get the best of me, and sometimes me wanting somebody to really excel, I get my own way. And sometimes I do have to, you know, maybe I made a mistake, and I have to, and I have to uh, ask that person to to move on their career, or maybe they just can't take me, and they they move on their career. Most of the time, it's I don't really terminate people, especially high level executives. They you just torture me. them till they quit. They, they terminate me. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, you know, I can't work for this this guy. This guy's out of his mind. Um, but if you, I always say, if you work with me for six months, you'll probably want to work with me for a long time because once we get over that hump of six months and turn around the hotel, I, my only job is to go around and make sure you're happy and you get incentives and you're taken care of. But the first six months, you know, we, cr we crush each other because you have to to turn around, especially a really big hotel. You, you realize if RGMs lost 17 people, they would be negative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those were executives. Yeah. Well, you know, what happens, this is what happens to people in the bigger hotels. It's like you come up in this business, where I still feel like I have to prove myself every day. I feel like I just started in this business. And I'm 53 years old, been doing this 32 years. And people, like, when they get into the, you know, high-paying jobs and all the incentives and all the people around them, they truly feel like the world owes them something. And then they meet me, and I'm like... You, you, you have an office. I'm going to take the office away from you because you seem to like the office a lot. And like your job is to take care of your housekeepers. Your job is to take care of your front desk. Your job is not to take care of the guests in the bigger hotels. It's to take care of your employees so your employees can take care of the guests. And I think executives, you know, they, they forget that. And so I just, I'm a reminder. So how do you keep the, uh, the positivity up in the environment when you come in and you're firing all these people that you see as uh, negative influence? And I think about what we talked about before is vulnerability and transparency. It's like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Matter of fact, I got on stage. There were 1,500 people in the audience. We were, in, we were at um, a hotel, the hotel in Orlando that has entertainment uh, uh, area, and we're on the stage, and I have all the employees, and I'm brand new to the to the uh, hotel. And I said, I've never run a hotel in Orlando. I've never run a resort. I've never run a hotel with entertainment, and I've never run pools. I've just never had. We had 100,000 square foot of pools. I have never run that. I've only run an up and down 170 or 300 room hotel in New York City. So who better than me to run your hotel? And everybody left because they got the joke. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but we're going to do it and we're going to figure it out, and I can only do it with you. So I think transparency and vulnerability, it's, it's worked for me, and sometimes people look at me like I'm out of my mind, and I say, you're right, I don't know what I'm doing, but let's figure this out together. I think the more you hide and the more you, you're not in on the joke that you don't know what the hell you're doing sometimes, I think the more it gives people ammunition to come after you. How do you actually fire somebody? I had to do it once in my life. It was one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do. Well, after the first... Um, I'd say 20 years, I stopped crying uh, when, when I, because I never, ever want to put somebody out of a paycheck, ever. It's my last resort. But it's easier for me with the higher level executives because you should know better at this point. Um, you just, you're just very careful. You, you don't make a, a rash decision. You give people, I give people way too many chances. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, most of the people realize three weeks after that is the best thing ever happened to them and they go on to something, you know, much better. Right. Yeah. I've never had um, a failure in life that didn't turn into a, a super positive. So how do you discern whether somebody needs to be fired or just hasn't been given the uh, proper tools and created a lot of bad habits and might appear as a bad employee? Listen, some people just suck at their job and they need to do something else. <laughs> that, I mean, uh, that's it. It's like, it's like, that's it. It's like if you, like, I'll give you the perfect example. I'll use myself as an example. I was an asset manager for $2 billion worth of assets in New York City, and I did it for two years, and I was relatively successful at it. 
But there was probably people a lot better than me at it because I didn't like doing it. But I did it because it was the best education I've learned about development. I learned about, you know, cash flow and really, really learned the business from probably the best company I could have ever uh, learned from. But to tell you I was the best asset manager in the world would be a friggin' lie because I want to be in the operation. I'm supposed to tell the general manager who did a good job, well, you have to save a couple dollars here, save a couple dollars there. Whereas I want to give them money to spend on bonuses and incentives and, and making the hotel better is I'm trying to pinch pennies. So I, 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 I kind of sucked at it. So, so you have to like, people sometimes just want to be successful. There's a difference about wanting to be successful and wanting to be happy. You know, you can be both. You know, there's a lot of successful people that are miserable. Right. Okay, I know a lot of them. I've seen them too. Right, and I know a lot of people that don't have the careers that they thought they would have because they made decisions. I had a lieutenant colonel in the military who's still a friend of mine today, and the reason he didn't make a full bird, which is a full colonel, was because I made decisions for my family. So I retired a lieutenant colonel instead of a full bird colonel, and I don't regret it. So same thing in my career. So you have to make the decisions to be successful and to be happy. If you're just making it to be successful, something's going to bite you in the butt. I guess that sweet spot is finding the way to be both successful and happy. But the opposite of success is failure. So, Mr. Brian Warganese, one of the questions we have up there Great is, uh, <laughs> what is one of your biggest failures? Oh, oh. you, Glenn. We only have 20 minutes left. Oh, um, wow. I should have I should have planned for that one. Um, I, I I guess you know not not necessarily a failure, but I, I'd say that you know thinking that at one point I, that this was easy. And it's not. So I, I do actually. So I'm going to step back a little bit. My father gets an apology from me right now. Um, but, y you know, when you look at this stuff and you're not the owner, it's really easy to say, well, just write out a check. So when I started in the business, I did a lot of on his dime. And I don't think it was a failure, but in my mind, it was a failure because I just thought that if he didn't, if, if the property didn't cash flow, write out a check. It's your business. You know, that that's what you do. And I opened my own hotel in 1999, the first one, all on my own, and it's a whole different experience. When you're writing so, a check. <laughs> yep, and, and, and when, so the failure was I failed to realize that that's not how life works. Money, there's just not an endless pot at the end of the rainbow. All right, Anthony? I remember I worked at the Lucerne Hotel for a gentleman named Ron Dome, who really gave me my start in the business. He took a chance on a guy who's never run a hotel before. And I remember sitting with him. I got the job, and I'm sitting with him maybe six months into the job. And we're on every Thursday, we'd sit on his floor, and we had about $300,000 worth of bills to pay. And there was a phone bill for, I don't know, let's say $4,000 for the hotel. And, there was a, and this is a true story. There was a 75-cent charge on the phone bill. And he asked me, as we're sitting there literally going through every line of every single bill, and I remember just cursing under my breath going, this is insane. I got a hotel to run. And he said, what's that 75 cent charge? And I said, I don't know. And so I went back. He asked me to look at it. I looked at it. And it was, you know when you press like star to kind of have the operator dial automatically for you back in the day? Anyway, so it was if you press star, you get charged 75 cents and you don't have to dial the number. So I went back and I was like, and I was like, I wouldn't say I was like embarrassed or whatever, but I was like, all right, you know, I was busy. I pressed star and it cost 75 cents. So I walk in, I told him and he goes, well, who did it? I said, well, it came from my line, so it was probably me. And he said, is that how you're going to spend my effing money? And he didn't say effing. And I was like, no, sir. And it was the greatest lesson I ever learned because I realized that, yeah, it looked like the guy had a lot of money, which he did, and he had a very successful hotel, and we were making a lot of money, but it wasn't my 75 cents. And it was the most valuable lesson in the history of my career because I don't spend a penny unless I can justify it 75 times. And so that, like you, that, that was kind of my failure in not accepting or understanding that it's not my money. And it seems like it's 75 cents, man, I'm a busy guy. It's like, well, if it was my 75 cents, I can make that decision. Right, so it's not just about it being 75 cents, it's about your whole connection to spending uh, the, the money. So Absolutely, and listen, I had, and, and not too far after that, I had twins, and the guy bought me a brand new car, so he wasn't cheap. He was just trying to teach me a lesson, and he taught me a really good lesson. I remember he came up to me one day, he goes, uh, blue or white? And I was like, well, it can't be a suit, because I don't think he'd buy me a white suit. And I said, blue just to be safe. And he threw me the keys. He goes, all right, I got it right. And he bought me a brand new Volvo. So, right. so if I give you 75 cents, what does that get me? What's that? If I give you 75 <laughs> cents, what does that get me? <laughs>
everybody, Glenn here. So listen to this. Cobblestone Hotels is celebrating their 10th anniversary, and man, have they accomplished a lot in the last decade. Already, they have more than 150 hotels throughout the United States, but they're in smaller and medium-sized markets. Those markets that the big franchise companies, they're underserving, they're overlooking, and in some cases, just ignoring. But Cobblestone is an expert in these markets. And their president and CEO, Brian Wagernese, listen, I've gotten to know him in the last 10 years, and he has worked every job possible, including being an owner and operator. I can personally vouch for how awesome this company is, how awesome he is as an individual, because he understands the importance of finding the right combination of hotel brand and franchise owner. He's also an incredibly dedicated professional. Whether it's a cobblestone hotel and suites Main Street design, Borders Inn and Suites, or one of the newly acquired brands such as Boulders Inn and Suites, Key West Inns, Centerstone Inns and Suites, Cobblestone has brands that range from economy to upper mid-tier and one that's right for you. Quite simply, Cobblestone Hotels is the franchise for franchise owners. Patrick Mullenix, well, he's their cobble, he's Cobblestone's new president of franchise development. Give him a call or check out their website at cobblestonefranchising.com. But give Patrick a call. He's a great guy. I've known him for a really, really long time, too. You can find him at 920-216-0620. That's cobblestonefranchising.com. And tell him Glenn sent you. All right, so uh, you know, uh, I, I think that just takes us into a whole notion of of failure, and I love uh, that you guys both learn from failure, and I think that's something that everybody in this room should be able to do. We all make mistakes, we all are in over our heads, we all drop the ball, we all fail, but it's about how we recover and how we learn from it. I think that is quintessentially important. And I, and I think it's you, yes, I agree with you 100, percent but I think it comes down to: Are you doing it for the right reasons? Right. Because when you fail, are you doing it because if you're trying to be successful and you're trying to compensate for your failure, you have to recalibrate. Because if you failed and you're just not good at that, then stop doing that and right. do something else. And I think that something in my career has happened over the period of time where I realized my number one priority is to make myself happy. You know. I have a family, I have a wife, I have children, I have a career, I have a business, I have a TV show, I have a lot, I have podcasts with my friend Glenn, but if I'm not happy, and if I am not getting up in the morning and really running into whatever I have to do, whether it be bring my kid to a volleyball tournament or whether it be doing the podcast, and we have a lot of fun doing the podcast, I'm not going to do it. And it's not that with financially I can just tap out and say I'm done and you know retire. I can't. I still have to work for a living. And, but I choose what I want to be happy with. And it's really true throughout my whole career. There were hotel companies that I won't go into it. There's one hotel company I refused to work for. It was early on in my career. It was a lot of money, a lot of prestige. And the gentleman's in jail today. Okay? The gentleman I, I said no to is in jail for embezzling. So I just trust my instincts. Right. Yeah, I, I think that makes a, a, a whole lot of sense, An Anthony. I'm, I'm on your side with this. Anytime I've had the major colossal failures in my life, it's because I didn't have the passion behind me. I wasn't all in on it. So I actually, in retrospect, when you think rationally after you get past the emotion of being fired, for example, or told that you're no good in a situation, when you can actually realize what your role is in it, in it and what you actually brought to it and why you failed because... In my case, I wasn't passionate about stuff, so I didn't work as hard. I let things slip, and therefore, I dug myself a, a big, giant hole. Yeah, for me, what I realized at some point um, is I don't like being controlled. And I, I literally, I, 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 can't, like, I can't have anyone controlling my destiny. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take my destiny in my own hands, and if I fail, I'd rather fail on yep. my terms than succeed on your terms. So I just, I have a serious problem with people controlling my destiny. All right, I got a great question for you, and I, haven't know, I know what the answer is going to be. Um, what is the weirdest marketing tactic that you've seen that actually worked? And I think, What's the uh, weirdest marketing? You, you tell me what it is. I think it was the uh, $1,000 martini myself that you, uh, that you did. The ten thousand dollar martini. Ten thousand dollar martini. Anybody Sorry. ever hear Martini on the Rock, the, where you put a diamond in the bottom of the martini and the guest pays for it, buys it? It's called the Martini on the Rocks at the Algonquin Hotel. Anyone? Come on, anyone. So was this? Was this about 12, 15 years ago? 
It was about 15 years ago. About it was the number, yeah. So basically, it was the Algonquin Hotel in New York City. We turned it around. We renovated it in 28 days. First time in 100 years it's been closed. And actually, 90 something years. It, um, it's going to be 100, I think, this year. Anyway, so um, when we were reopening it, we were kind of like the Algonquin was kind of like 1907 was the hotel, but everybody forgot about it the last 30 years, and the hotel owners were losing their shirt. And I said, okay, when we open it, I don't have a lot of money, I don't have a lot of marketing, I need to, I need to get a lot of attention. So I hired a company called uh, Quinn and & Co, and this young lady, uh, Carla Cacavalli, worked there. And long story short, we had a lot of stress between both of us. We weren't getting along, she wasn't bringing it to the table. Eventually I said, we need something, we need something now or I'm done. Uh, matter of fact, I talked to Carla last night, she's still a very dear friend of mine. And I said, come up with something, and she goes, I don't work that way. I can't come up with something right on the fly. She goes, I got to use the ladies' room. And she walks off, she walks off the, the table in the middle of the lobby. She goes down to the ladies' room. She comes back up. She looks at the lobby, and she goes, you guys are known for the martini. I said, yes, we are. She goes, you guys have a lot of engagements in your hotel. I said, yes, we do. She goes, I want to do something where someone can buy a diamond from your hotel, put it in the uh, martini, you put it on the menu, and when the guest comes in, their fiance doesn't know, but they're going, or their girlfriend or boyfriend doesn't know, but they're going to order the martini, and it's going to have a diamond at the end of it. I said, but I don't have a, um, a jeweler in the hotel. He, she goes, you're two blocks from Rockefeller Center. There's 100 jewelers. Just get a jeweler. You bring the person to the, to, to the jeweler. He picks out the diamond. They pay for the diamond. They bring it to you. You put it in a safe. When the person comes with their, with their girlfriend or boyfriend, you put it in the martini, and the rest is history. I literally got everybody at the table up. I told her to sit down. And I said, you just gave us the best marketing campaign in the history of the hotel business. And we were rated the number one marketing uh, idea in the history of the hotel business for that, for that decade. But right. let, let me just for, real finish. So we, so the next day, uh, we're watching uh, David Letterman. And David Letterman has a hat on. Oh, it has behind his back, and he goes, hey, anybody ever hear of the Ogakwin Hotel here in Times Square? A couple of people in the audience applaud. He goes, yeah, you can buy a martini for $10,000, and it comes with a hat, and he puts the hat on and says, jackass, <laughs> because he doesn't get that there's a diamond at the end of it. So the point being is we got in front of like three or four billion people to the point where, um, like two years after that, it was in Trivia Pursuit. Okay, and the question was, what is at the bottom of the Algonquin's martini on the rock? And the answer is a diamond. So when you get into True Your Pursuit, that's an iconic marketing campaign. And we won every award in the, in, in the industry. But again, the point being was that I was aggressive, I wouldn't take no for an answer, and I had really good people around me, and we came up with a great marketing idea. Right, but more importantly, what I think it did for the, uh, the, the property was it really reinvented how marketing could be done. It didn't matter whether or or not a single martini was sold. It was all about the idea of getting that idea out to the general public and becoming part of the zeitgeist of culture and stuff like that, which is why it was so successful and one of the many reasons why you were able to turn that property around. Well, we did a show uh, called Extraordinary uh, with Carla. I have another podcast called Extraordinary where I interview people who I think are ordinary, but they do extra because I don't believe in extraordinary people. I believe in ordinary people that do extra. And we went through that whole philosophy of what happened. And after we had all the success, we're, we're, on, the, um, we're on everything, CNN, we're everywhere. David Letterman, um, I call her up like 24 hours later and I say, hey, we need somebody to buy it, but we need to have them buy it legitimately. I don't want to set this up. And she was in Toys R Us and she used some profanities and she hung up the phone, but she called me back like a couple hours later. She goes, I have a friend that has that's looking to get engaged. I said, as long as he buys it, we'll do it. Long story short, they come in, they buy it. It's on the front page of the Daily News. We get the second wave of, uh, of uh, marketing. Yeah. And that's a way of spending very little money and getting a lot of benefit. As a matter of fact, it was a $1,000 martini when we first created it, and I called the owner, Jim Miller, who actually uh, owns Miller Global here in, in Denver, and I said, Mr. Miller, we're, we're doing this $1,000 martini. I'm going to need a couple thousand dollars to buy, you know, crystal glasses and all kinds of stuff just to, for the, the art and maybe get a photographer, and he said, make it a $10,000 martini. I said, Good idea. And that is about being transparent, about telling your owner, telling your PR person what you expect, and everybody being involved. And I didn't come up with the idea. I didn't have one creative thought in my brain in that whole marketing idea, but everybody attributed it to me because I was the person that facilitated it because I wouldn't take no for an answer. 
Right. I, I love that. And I think the, the lesson to be learned here is when you all go back to your individual hotels is that you should get out there and try different things. And if it doesn't work, don't get caught up by the failure of it. Try something else until you figure out what people are going to really respond to. But getting back to what we were talking about yeah. before in our last podcast was we were being true to who the hotel was. She said, Carla said, you're known for the martini. Yes. You, people get engaged in your lobby all the time. Yes. Those two things in the Algonquin made sense. If there, she came up with something else, like she said, hey, we're going to come up with a $1,000 cheeseburger. Well, the Algonquin and cheeseburger doesn't make sense. It probably wouldn't work. And it literally brought back the Algonquin, uh, at least the, the bar and restaurant. I mean, the numbers we were doing two weeks after that were out of control. All right, so we have time for one more question. I'd like for both of you guys to answer. Uh, I was hoping you weren't going to ask me to top that. Uh, no, no, I'm just going to. I'm going to. I'm going to ask you, what is your craziest hotel experience that you can remember? Oh, boy, um, as far as the guest perspective or the employee, however matter. you approach it. Okay, so here's. I've, I've had. We're, I don't know what came up earlier, but when when I first when I managed my first hotel, I was my father owned. I wanted to make sure that nothing went wrong. So I told the employees, anything happens, you call me no matter what time in the day. You know what changed that? A call at 3 o'clock in the morning to ask where the paper clips were. <laughs> <laughs> and I came in the next day and said, we're going to readjust this right, right. now. So. My, my wife, when I worked at the Plaza Hotel, I was the front office manager, and my wife, every time the phone rang, it was before cell phones, she said, uh, the plaza's calling. They probably can't find the pencils. So, yeah, I had the same philosophy. And you get calls like, where are the pencils? Um, are you asking me the same question? Uh, I, yeah, what is the crazy? But I think maybe um, either personal or set it against the backdrop of the hotel and possible experiences that you've had. The hotel and spa? Uh, well, I, I won't say I would do. Uh, there's so many crazy experiences on Hotel Impossible. Um, but you've seen At most least 150, of them. You've, right? seen, you've seen most of them because, we, I, believe me, if it was crazy, the editors would never keep it out. So you saw it. Um, so tr trust me, every, everything is out there. Um, I would say the craziest thing that from Hotel Impossible Experience is I created this show with my partners, Leo Rossi and Lynn Rossi. And we sold it to, or we brought it to a company called Atlas Media. Atlas Media brought it to Travel Channel, and the rest was history. So you're taking a guy that, again, doesn't like being controlled, who's been in the industry for 30 years, knows everything inside and outside of a hotel, or likes to think he does, and now you're going on television. And the reason reality shows have a bad reputation is because a lot of them aren't real. Because you take a guy who may be good on camera, you put him in an environment, and by the third or fourth episode, they got nothing else to say. Well, you put me in front of a hotel for 20 years, and I'm always going to have something to say. So convincing the producers that just put the camera on and let me do my job, you don't need to give me an outline or words or scripts or anything because I'm not listening to anybody. And I don't want to see the owner. I don't want to see the hotel. So that this was really weird to everyone. It's like, we're going without an outline? I said, you can go without an outline. I don't need an outline. You know? And anyway, it took us five seasons and 18 producers we went through to finally get the team that I literally go in blind and trust them uh, 100%. But there's a lot more fireworks to five seasons behind the scenes than there were in front of the scenes. <laughs> so, so, Glenn, what's your, what's, your, what's your craziest guest experience besides your shampoo issue? Uh, well, that, well, that is a pretty serious <laughs> issue. One time um, I got room service and I had to get the, uh, the hamburger because there's not many other choices. And uh, I opened up the top, and someone had already taken a big bite out of it. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. So I guess I just wanted to test it to make sure it was uh, up to par. <laughs> you, asked, you asked the best question, he got the biggest applause. What yeah. am I doing? <laughs> Quality hey, control. Well, I can I tell you? All right, so we're just about out of time, so we don't have a chance for us to tell us something that we don't know. So we've got to wrap up right now. Um, Brian, um, how about just giving us a, a good final word? And for the listeners that are listening to the podcast, how can we learn more about Cobblestone and become part of the Cobblestone family? Well, is this my shameless plug kind of yep. thing? Yeah. Okay, well, cobblestonefranchising.com. Yes, that's it. Um, you know, again, just, you know, as we, as we talked in the last podcast, just we, we want to keep, keep having the relationship with the people that we have and, and, and keeping that consistent as we grow. So I know everybody, I, I know when we were smaller and I'm looking at Wayne, Nebraska, I think we were number eight or nine. And the question comes up, when you get bigger, how are you still going to be able to, you know, be as personable? And it, it definitely gives more layers, but I, I don't know, Ken, tell me if I'm wrong. Am I still there? You know, and that... 
that was a long time ago, and, and, and I'm hoping that we can still do this. Now, don't call me at 3 o'clock in the morning for paper clips. It's not my problem. But, you, you know, the, uh, a majority of the investors have my number or, or the ones that I've worked with on development, or they have the developer's number, or they have... I know Josie's team, I'm pretty sure those are on the internet somewhere. Um, but they have them and there's no lack of response, not a eight to five, this is what you do, otherwise send an email and we'll get to right. you during business. I just hours. want to be sure that uh, paperclip thing, does it extend to thumbtacks as, as well? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, no, we don't, those are dangerous. So right. We don't buy those, <laughs> okay. but that's a whole new liability. You, you know, talking about paperclips, I actually stopped using paperclips a long time ago because I had an assistant, Alice at the Algonquin Hotel who's still there, and she used to yell at me all the time because we couldn't find something, a piece of paper. And I know, I was like, I gave that to you. And she's like, no, I didn't. And one day I found it uh, attached to a paper clip and I showed it to her. So I, I banned paper clips from the office. I said, no more am I getting yelled at from my assistant about losing paperwork. It's always attached to a paper clip. So that, 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 that's, that's what you're that's, when you, get, things, that's well, when you get the call because you're out. <laughs> one of the things you, you, you and, and saying what you just said, is you've been forced into. In the beginning, it seems that you were like trying to stay on top of everything, and then you were forced into delegating because your job got so much bigger. And when you get forced into delegating, and you're basically forced into shutting a part of your brain off, or you're going to explode, you better have really good people around you, right? Right. And and back then, you know, when we were smaller at that time, you know, the the, the way Nebraska time, nothing happened without me knowing about it. Now. There's more things happening that I don't know about, but I know they're being taken care of, if that makes sense. Right, and people are saying, oh, don't ask him. He'll just get in the way, right? Well, and that's the best <laughs> place to be. Right. Uh, so I, uh, can, I can still check in a guest. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll take that challenge. So, uh, Anthony, where can we uh, find you online? Tell us about Extraordinary Podcasts, all that good stuff. Uh, are you not going to ask me about something I don't know? Uh, we don't have time. We're already over our allotted time for the day. Oh, okay. Um, real quick. Where do we... Uh, oh. Uh, you can find me anywhere you want to be on the internet at Anthony at uh, Anthony at Anthony. AnthonyHotels.com. All right. Excellent. And um, also listen to this Extraordinary Podcast, which drops every Thursday on iTunes and elsewhere. And for me, Glenn Hausman, besides hosting this show, um, I do a lot of speeches around the country, but I also do the No Vacancy Podcast, where I talk to the top leaders in hospitality, the Hotel Design Podcast. My newest episode is going to feature uh, Paul Steelman, who's um, been actively involved in every major casino resort that you all can think of out there. We do the Hotel Tech Podcast, and we also do the Business of Hotels Podcast, if you want to learn all about it. So join me at Traveling Glenn online and all the other places. And, and I'm writing a new podcast for you. What's that? It's called How to Be Successful at Podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you, who would have thought that I would have a job doing this when the technology Listen, didn't I could, exist? I could have went to anybody for podcasts and I came to you, so how the hell do I do this? I know. Well, this is awesome. But we've had a great time here at the Cobblestone Hotels event in Denver, Colorado. Let's hear it for uh, Anthony Bryan. I want to thank all of you at home for listening. Be sure to give us that five-star ratings on five tunes. Thanks for listening, and thanks for checking in. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn, teaching you to be the hotel you're that you wanna be. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn.